so today we have the power of you and with us we have radhika singh with us and uh, i would like to introduce her a little bit she is a premier mind coach and she has been coaching the lead and olympic athletes corporate heads educators and students for more than two decades along with that she is also an author with her books she has been empowering them helping them to become self reliant and find their self so we are very lucky to have her here with us today and we hope we'll also discover a little bit of power of you Absolutely. while talking with her <laughs> so thank you very much for the introduction thank you how lovely so it's um, i have to say the the power of you starts with the fact that we're in a city like bombay and you find resonation to a city that is so open to people mm -hmm. and the problem with humanity today is that we're not allowing other people to come into our spaces right and if we were to ideally share everything that empowered us or uh, made us evolve then we wouldn't be in a space where we're fighting or we're competing or there's more dis ease or this paranoia of anything because then everything is out there for you to learn together and i think and i do believe that one of the reasons that i found you to be the protagonist of the story i tell is because it allows you to find the power within you directs you forces you uh, to go and reach for that rhythm within you that that song that you can sing which are reticent to sing and when you work with people when i work with people on a daily basis there's everything from so i work with psychosomatic uh, illness which is um, as much uh, as much of a manifestation as an allergy or a phobia uh, somebody's loss in an accident of a child and then somebody's car got scratched by a through driver by the boy who passed by who's as angry or more than somebody who lost yeah. their baby um and all of it is fine because pain um is not just a perception it becomes so real it becomes part of your journey and genetically you carry it with you so the idea of doing this work was to generate a means for people to self regulate themselves when you self regulate yourself you have greater power than if you are put on a chair and told that you can heal you i can help you heal or i have a solution or a method or an algorithm or an expression i my conscious mind will hear it which is 10% of my mind but my subconscious which is 90% will not shift and change so just <coughs> so half the work that i do is with psychosomatic illness right the other half of the work uh i work with the olympians and why the olympians because just that rajivardhan rathore had won the first silver medal for the country and he was absolutely devastated and the country said this is the man for us he used to get us another medal and he was like you know he was an army man and uh, he trained as a, in the military and then when he rose up he said that peak was so high that then to come down obviously right after the medal and then to climb that up again and that really is where the journey of change rests in the human potential right it's how when we are high we are high when success we success but when we fall down it's so hard to pick up the pieces because your conscious mind is only 10% your subconscious is 90% of your mind so 90% of your mind is fighting with you whether you like it or not 90% of your mind is what challenges you to not get your allergy okay to not um let your heart remain unbroken to not um uh, want to be in a marriage or in any relationship or work or earn money or whatever it may be right um and so after that i went and studied i saw a hypnotist Uh, now hypnosis has been wearing a cloak of mysticism for years. The movies and they did all the pendulum, which works, right? And so people ask me, so oh God, I got your hypnotist. I don't want to see you. Like this happens all the time, right? All the time. And we're like, oh, you know, she's a hypnotist. Oh my God. Okay, so that's the re reaction. She's very cute. Uh, and I say to them, and they're like, how do you do it? How do you do it? And I'm like, you know what? Actually, the only time you sit in my chair is the time you're not in hypnosis, because we're hypnosis is acceptable uh, is acceptance of suggestions and that only happens all the time with us we're watching tv and we're watching the cricket match and five times or seven times they'll advertise say how much is the secret of my energy or energy whatever and you're watching it and you're letting that suggestion go in then you go to the market and your child comes and says mama i need something in my milk and you're not thinking whether that damn thing has 
great potential for your child is going to repair cells or bones. You just like, give me a Horlicks, do. Why do you say it? Because you're hypnotized. Because you've heard this so many times without judging it. It's sitting inside. The first thing you do is you react. And it's the same that we react to other things. So, uh, so the idea of working with people was one, to be able to help them learn about their mind so they can empower it or walk through this whole uh, space. So being a hypnotist and a hypnotherapist uh, allowed me, and I've always studied my psychology, helped me to focus on the subconscious mind. And then uh, when I worked with Ajivarth and we went to the Olympics, it was such a powerful tool to use, and that's a formula and algorithm I have developed, honestly, to use to regress um, athletes to that finest space in their head where they trigger the shot. So they're, they're right there and something happens and the trigger finger is frozen. They don't know what the hell to do with it. There's nothing you can do. Right? Or they start focusing and the previous shot comes in their head and they get distracted. And the difference is so much. Right? So for instance, if I'm training skeet, it's from eight stations and the clay target comes from a high house and a low house at the same time. So to every station, it comes out of different uh, spa uh, times and different heights. Uh, I train double trap, for which two clay targets come out. Train trap, so it's different. I work with 25 meter rapid fire pistol, which is a stationary target. I mean, I've been there was 10 meters, uh, 25 meters, uh, which is again stationary. So it's um, it, what I'm trying to say is that the mind is so fragile, and yet the mind is so uh, vulnerable to your strength, right? And why I say vulnerable to your strength? Because your strength is inherently always present. We're always carrying the divine portion with us. It's innately present and we, as life goes by, we take in cumulative experiences and that becomes the subconscious. So either it makes you feel powerful or not. And it's not if you're a weak person that you can't change because anything you put into your subconscious is a belief. And to believe is to not know. It's like saying, I know it's going to rain. I can see it. Or I can say, I believe it's going to rain. So there's a degree of uh, change that is uh, <coughs> born into every situation. And so the idea of the work was, how can I find a way in an algorithm? So on a day, I could start work at, say, 10.30. I could start with a girl who's been molested. Uh, to my next session will be an Olympian looking to find a new way to pick up the gun because he just can't do the same thing over again because he's practiced a million times and now he's just bored. His brain is just not wanting to get that focus. But so much has been invested in him. He's won an Olympic quota. And there's so many different... Uh, so people ask me, what do you do with them? And I'm like, what do I not do with them? <laughs> because, and it's much beyond motivation. It's more about technique because they're not able to reach within their own head. Uh, it's like when I'm doing this, it's not like I'm thinking about it, it's just happening, right? So imagine if I've done this every day and then suddenly I'm not supposed to do this and I'm like, oh my God, how do I get the target and look at my speed and look at my muscle and look at the position and not break the rule, da 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 da, and know which shot to do next and forgotten which where the claim out, claim out, came out from because they measure the amount of targets that come out from the left, right or straight. So you have to also calculate that. Your heart is beating fast, you learn how to control it. So all these mechanisms. So the idea is that hypnosis really became a tool for me to use, but to enable the mind to get from where you are to where you need to be. And so it doesn't matter whether I go from a girl who's molested to an Olympian to somebody who just feels like they're just not going anywhere to an allergy or a phobia or stuttering and stammering. And the beauty is that for me, why it's so beautiful is because I don't, I believe that the one thing I've done has been very integrated with my, with the, with the potential of a therapist to heal you because I say that I offer you the potential. So I've never booked a second session. And I know most psychologists around the world think it's the dumbest thing to do because Murga mil gaya to. Let's make this person a client. And except for sports where you have to get to the Olympics or get to a World Cup and you constantly need to change your technique, work with reinforcement. You've dropped a game. You're completely heartbroken. How do you make a change to shift it? The World Cup is like, I've just come back. My trap, who's the uh, Olympian who won the first quota place for India. We just went to Cairo. He came back day before. 
and day after he's leaving for Morocco, there are two World Cups. Um, and in India, when you get a Olympic quota, you get it for the country, then you fight for it with, which is people who can do better for it than you in trials. So it's very competitive. And so it really doesn't matter because the, the, the idea is that when a person comes into the chair, he should be, or he or she must be um, given the chance to reveal it all. And if you give him another chance, it's like in saying, I had a terrible time parking and you'll be like, what happened? I'll be like, never mind, I'll tell you later, not important. So you keep pushing that pain and this and within you and the last thing you want to do is talk about it and reveal it because it pains you. So I say this to every single person who comes there, I'm like, you can find this time and place to be, to reassure you that you'll go back with, with a change. When you feel shifted, if it's not even if when you start to feel shifted, I'll be available. Come back in four days. I don't say ten, a week because then you have to, and that is the subconscious <coughs> mind. And I think ninety nine percent of people do come back, and sometimes it's gone. Sometimes it's an allergy or a phobia, uh, which is a perception of the mind, which is just gone because not because it's magic, but because you help them find the origin of that issue, and you take it and you. Dismiss it, make it irrelevant, uh, add forgiveness. And I'm not saying, so none of the work is addressing the conscious mind. I'm not giving you my advice. This is not what happens. The first thing I do is help them find trust in themselves. So I will help them enable their autonomic nervous system, which is your parasympathetic and sympathetic response. Parasympathetic is your healing room, helps you rest and relax. Sympathetic is fight or flight. So if a bee comes, I'll just do this, right? That's fight or flight. That's already made sure that my heart has gone erratic, my digestive gases uh, are, are active, uh, my saliva is working, my pupils are dilated. So now you can imagine what an athlete does. Mm -hmm. So I also train, for instance, ice hockey in America right now. And that's a fast game. And so I'm, I'm training one sort of athlete at the moment. The, the major chunk is the people who are really fast because ice hockey is really yeah. fast. Yeah. And shooters who are damn so slow that they can freeze. Yeah. So it's interesting. I like the variation. I think one learns. I learn about one and then the other. Uh, and so while I was doing all this, obviously, and I think at the time when I was taking up enough to the Olympics and there were uh, 27 Olympians I was working with at one go. And uh, at those years, for some reason, a lot of children were cutting their wrists. A lot of them were doing, overdoing drugs. And I kept getting calls and I couldn't work with them because I was committed to this. And I said, this is so bizarre. Like, I'm working with some luxury clients who can go yeah. anywhere in the world, you know, who are supported by sports. And my local, so I said, you know what, I have, to, I have to do this. I have to do something. And so came the books, right? Because I feel that, like I was saying to, I think, you that, very dear friend of mine, Manisha Gira Baswani, who's an artist, she said in one of the documentaries she did for me, and she said, if you don't find the books anywhere, find Radhika in your life. And I think it's so beautiful because I just, and that's the reason I write. If I can't get to people, um, and, and the reason I feel like I need to get to people is because I do believe I represent the divine and when I do the work. Uh, doesn't make me a guru. We're all exactly the same. Um, in fact, I believe that every single person is the guru because each sure. one of us is carrying the divine portion and technically that's true. Technically, we're just molecules, we're just atoms and mole molecules and atoms and positrons, or neutrons, electrons, and all of it is a photon. And photon is light. It's just that the world has tighter molecules, we have a different set, water is a different set. Technically, we're just frequency, right? And so it doesn't separate any of us. It just technically can't. So if I can find that divine within me when I'm sitting and doing the work, the other person can resonate with it. And if you can teach him the tools to find himself, so I start with a few, uh, not, not tests, but a few examples of how they can find their breath, control their mind. And as they start trusting me, they go deeper. And so every session is a piece of art. And that's when you said gallery. I said, so interesting because I don't believe I've done a second session like the first one. There's no algorithm. I've never had a script. Um, how do you um, give respect to a human being if you're going to reduce him to an algorithm? Because then the beauty is lost, right? Um, and I find that divine assists you. Now, divine could be the air, I don't know, 
it's not going to be it's not a man sitting on the clouds but it is something that reaches out to you and strengthens spirit as it does to everybody when you hear it you sing the melody when you don't you, you get quiet you get depressed so when you deviate from your center you can't do much for yourself and the books are a means for you to continuously be present and I don't believe that you have to go through everything but if I can allow one page to make me feel better uh, I'm already anchored to this so every time I see the book and that's why the name every time I see the book it will be a positive anchor for me I don't really need to work on something I don't need a you know and of course I've outlined every single part of the process I'm not hiding any of that and I know a lot of therapists uh, have reached out and said you're using your books and I said like, yeah go ahead as a teaching mechanism because of course I've used this so much and then of course you end up in none of the first book with you and I they were like oh you know you've done this work you've done work with media talk about yourself and I'm like I don't want to be the guru because that's a myth because then the guru becomes another crutch you're already lacking in strength and ability you already feel the lack inside now the guru is your crutch now you start have to do this work exercise to reach the Guru. The Guru is inside you. So find the shortcut. Empower them to go within their quotient and recognize it. Now somebody who is not doing so well or somebody who is not in their center or somebody who is in chaos or in a situation, very hard for them to even listen to this. Sure. Who are you speaking with? You are speaking with somebody who is already feeling disempowered. And so little by little and and I feel the books are meant to come to you little by little, right? Each step restores one cell and the one cell exponentially goes in and repairs the other <coughs> cell. And so, funnily, all my friends, especially Bombay, they go, you're such a fun person, even Delhi, I think, everywhere. You're such a fun person, like, you'll find me at Sting on first row at the Lola, literally third row, I think, mm -hmm. singing. And the crowd around me started saying, he'll come to that. I'm like, yeah, but I'm so excited. So he's saying, there'll be clouds. I'm saying, no, rain. And they'll be like, yeah, he'll sing it. I'm like, yeah, but I'm excited. Let me express myself. So all of my videos are, my voice is louder than sting. So my friend said, send us videos. I'm like, I'm so excited. So I'm sting in Delhi? Yeah. Day before. Yeah, yeah. So here in Bombay? Yeah, so police. Police. At the Lola. What, what, what have I been under the rock? Yeah, I know. I had the same. Hey, studio. No, at the Lola oh, festival, at the uh, race course. Okay. And, uh, and, and so people always say, you're such a fun person. Why? So everybody bought this book first. And then, then I, none of my friends bought the second and third because they were like, we're still trying to read this. And the two reasons why people are still trying to read this. One, because the, the purpose of this book was it was a selfish reason. I wanted to reach out to people. That's selfish. Because that's me wanting to work with people. Um, and I couldn't be on my time. Because it does take two, two and a half hours to work through a session. Because I'm literally selling their soul to them. I'm just like, you know, I'm so excited to have somebody. And that excitement hasn't gone down. I have somebody in my chair. I will give them everything. Right? In that moment. And I know that they will go back home with something. They may not have lost theology, they do sometimes. They may not have lost, lost the stammering, they do sometimes. Eczemas disappear while we're working with them. All this happens and there's no magic and there's no mysticism. And I do also work with the spirit. I work with in between life. I work with the super conscious mind. So all of that. Um, but the, uh, the, the journey of change rests within you. And you have to be able to look as a mirror image at anything that you're doing and say, okay, I'm the, okay, this is my responsibility. And as long as I take responsibility, I will heal. You know, there, there is no question. So this, my question as a child was, I always say, where's God? Like, who's God? And it was such a big question in my mind as a child. Like, who's God? Bhagwan ka hai? Because we were Arya Samaji by yeah. just Punjabi Arya Samajis. And the idea is that worship nature because nature is going to give you the right sort of guidance to move to the next place. Um, and so I wondered, wondered, and I had a lot of spiritual epiphanies met by chance a lot of gurus and it all kept kept getting redirected back to me. And when I finally clicked in me, it was literally a click where I was like, oh, God is within us. It was like, ah, 
Then I was like, I have to talk about it. And to speak about it, I started borrowing from mythology. Because something needs to be, uh, something that's genetically uh, sort of like validated, um, needed to be uh, used as a tool to enhance my experience <coughs> or my um, sort of coincidence with presence or my coincidence with healing or my coincidence with learning. And I'm saying coincidence because people come to you at a certain time and place and you're meant to meet and do that. And so the book, so the for one reason it was um, difficult is because it's a lot about you need to know your purpose. You need to know who you are before you start to heal. You need to have a goal. You know, even when you invited me here, there has to be some goal attached to the climate of this gallery, where you want to take it, who are the people associated with it. And I believe that if, I truly believe that if we could understand who we are, essentially not as Radhika Kaurya Singh or about who we are as entities, as human, um, you know, now we have different names for for Your the fact <laughs> where we're right now looking at speaking with entities. There are people who are identifying life on other planets. There are people who are doing healing across planets. They're, this is also going to you know, become common in about 10-15 years. But when I started doing Reiki and I had a career in filmmaking, which was extremely successful. I was part of the Star TV team. We started with five, four bosses and me. I made the first Z logo. There was nothing but Doodarshan. Um, and then ZT kind of was still finding its feet. I met the ex CEO of Lintas, and he was starting sort of like a, he had two films on the floor, and I was doing my XIC in the evening. Um, and I walked in, and he said, You're oh, from Z, didn't realize like I've made one logo. Z was nothing, there was no program. And he said, Can you take on these two films? And I said, Yes. And I landed up making 24 corporate films in 22 months. And when we made corporate films, it was like buying the Umatic. We in a train to like Varsova, picking up a beta, designing the thing, meeting the client, everything. <coughs> and when ZTV came in, I'm telling you the story just to complete this. And uh, when Star TV came in and they called me back and told my boss I'm leaving and he was like, no, 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 what do you want to do? I said, we've got to make, we've launched the channel, we've got to, I still thought it was mine. And he said, we'll do it together. So what do you want to do? So I said, I want to make a quiz show. And he was like, okay, you can sell it to Z, see, you do it. So I created, thought of a quiz show, thought about it for like a good 30, 30 days maybe. Went to Rajiv Sinha and uh, Cadbury's, made it the Cadbury's Bond Vita Quiz Contest. And so it became the first ever show on TV and it ran oh, successfully. That was my baby. And then I did the brand equity quiz and etc. Et yeah. So all this was happening. Yeah. And I met a man in a train many years later and he said, what do you do? And I said, I'm doing regression. And he said, you know why you're in regression? I was like. Well, you know, whatever. You said what? Regression therapy, regress back to cause. <clears throat> I was like, yeah, well, I'm connected. I feel like this is my duty. And he's like, and then you know why you made films? And I was like, it was exciting. And he said, no, because when you make films, you go to the, the mise en scene is the, the, the art direction, the sound, the feeling, the expression, the pain, the joy. You wouldn't have understood as well if you hadn't made films because as a regression therapist, you go back to, so many screens of your life when you've buried that emotion in you and I was like wow that is something you can't see sometimes and to bring back the point to just observe yourself sometimes you need something to help you see so here's somebody talking about say the entire I've just opened this the entire cosmos is energized with the presence of the divine yeah I was just talking about it right the divine spirit is always perfectly in a state of presence ever existing and ever conscious how is it present? I have no money. My husband's left me. I've got one arm. How is it present? I'm asking the universe. Right? I read a book and the book tells me, wow. So I give up again. And then one day I'm saying, okay, this is about me. So then I go within. And slowly I start to understand that this is my world. It's my reality. And it's so I broke this book down into actually three, three different parts. The manifest universe is actually Brahma. So the book was meant to be Brahma, Vishnu, Shiva. And I published this and you've removed the Jews, you've removed the Muslims, you've removed Hamari Bari Baby Socho, you know, we have to sell the book. So I said, okay, how do we tie this down? So I made it the, the, the it is really Brahma. Because what's present, what's in your state of what's there, what, what is already manifested, right? Um, the rational mind is the state of I, which is Vishnu. And Vishnu is all about let's play with the universe. 
you know, let's play with Maya. Mm -hmm. And then the transpersonal the state of over is really Shiv because he says, Bhasam karo, let's get rid of the bad and let's get, let's move on. And so I stayed with my, sort of like inside my realm, but I made, offered the book to people also because for somebody, it may be important to accept your truth. What is my truth? Oh yeah, I'm present to this manifestation, this Prakriti and this Purusha. <coughs> one is form, one is formless. Then who is Ishwara? Then what is Jiva? Okay, Jiva may be tied to Purusha. Then ah. So you're, you're always trying to figure, are we really relevant? Is this really relevant? And when you really get the formula, you're like, okay, I'm meant to manifest my greatest good so I can see myself as the divine. And that's really what the Vedas talk about or even in many ways um, Islam talks about this. Like we've con converted this but at the end of it it's about how do you know Allah? How do you know the Divine? How do you know Vishnu? How do you know those components within you that are actually resonating with the Divine? You just forgot because you use your mind. So when you come to the mind and it says to eliminate anxiety. And on one day, I may be anxious about my child going to a phenomenal school. On the other day, I may be anxious about my hair turning white. And so, do I want people who are already so challenged, keep going to all these doctors who throw medicines at you, at surgeons who cut a tumor, who are psychologists who offer you counseling over and over again? No. I want you to know that this will work for any kind of anxiety. So, in my space, I just wanted to be extremely integrous to what I'm offering, right? I know that this has a high shelf life. You can use this for the rest of your life. I know that when I say to calmly sleep, I will. there will be times when I'm not sleeping well and I need this. I know that I need to generate endurance to different parts of my life. So I speak about endurance. I speak about anxiety. I speak about it and then I break it down into steps. And I say, this is how you can do this. And once you mastered it once, you know how to use the exercise. And then for people who are so not initiated into reading, there's also the 365 and sometimes you just read peace with I am that I am. A very simple line, but am I really at peace with everything that I am? No, I keep shifting and changing because the one constant is change. And so I may read this and then I may say, yeah, but then what? And then the, the next one I put here is the ultimate curative is a simple idea. I no longer am. So I'm like, okay, I've made a move somewhere. And like, okay, this is also not making sense for me. So I'm like, your perceptions are holding you back, not the lack of opportunities. I'm like, ah, that means I perhaps need to find the opportunity. Actually, it exists. Okay, my neighbor did ask me to make me the drawing. So it goes from one step to the other. So in my opinion, um, this book is very complicated for a lot of people, but it's easy because it's so, you know, it, it so generates the divine potential. Once you're resonating with the divine potential, then you have all the answers within you. Then all you need to really do is have the willingness and have the intention. And that is where we're all stuck in the world. We're stuck because of the, that lack within us is so deep that we've engaged with it. And you know, it's like when you go to a beach, first time as a child or whatever, maybe it's an adult. And you see somebody, you see a vase, you hear a vase. And, and you're like, oh my God, somebody drowning. Okay, and somebody's screaming and whatever. And you're like, no, no, she's having fun. Oh my God, I thought she was drowning, right? This is a normal experience. And then three months later, one year later, you go back to the beach. And your friends are like, you don't like the water? You're like, I like the water. Why aren't you coming to the water? You're like, I can't. Because you're not aware that you're scared. But something inside your subconscious, you're like, ah! got locked in. And now you're afraid of that water. And you don't know why, you don't want to, and you've made, spent, enough energy to make this, you know, program and come to the beach and you're like, damn, why am I going to the water? But there's something that are anchored and you're just holding on to it. So, so many times I find, and now I don't work, like I don't just regress. I, like I said, I want to solve everything. So, I will do the whole nine yards in a session um, and I will find that people are stuck at small things. Like I was crossing the street and the auto looked at me and I, he reminded me of my principal and uh, thank God it's not Mr. Pereira because oh, he really came to me. And then ever since that person comes, ever since that day I find that I'm just not able to go to work or I'm not performing because that, that memory triggered that memory that triggered that association 
and now for the rest of his life, he's worried, he's scared, or reticent, or not finding something. You know, so these are the. So it's not that the human mind is um, beyond repair. And I and if somebody can trigger you with the right willingness, it's like when I'm not clairvoyant at all. I can't look at you and tell you your life. But when we have a contract, now a contract. There's also a contract, but we have a contract where you come to me and you say, I'll give you an hour, can you help me? Or even sometimes it's friends. It's like, okay, listen, all that is fine. Just help me with this year, five minutes. I'll say, okay, chalo, let's go back and let's, you know, because I work with a lot of corporate work with a lot of neuro-linguistic tools. So you can find solutions like this, literally. And um, when I'm helping them uh, uh, make this repair, I mean, helping them make this change, there will be times that, I suddenly, and I, sometimes I don't know people, obviously. Most times I don't know people. I just know everything about their life. And then it's gone. It's not like I'm holding on to it. It's not like at the end of the day, I'm like, oh, I had a day. This was a bad day because I worked with the rape. It's never like that. It's always empowering. Because I know that I've done the work that I'm here for. <coughs> and so when I have two daughters, and when we were, we st I should take them to a park every day. <coughs> Uh, and Delhi has a lot of green spots, so you can take them to the park. And my f girlfriend who was also had two daughters, and she looked at me and she said, Art session ek hai na? Shagar Vidikra. She's also from Bombay, from uh, Pali Hill, and I grew up also here. And then it's Aaj to Bhat session ki hai, because that glow inside, that, that happiness quotient to have helped somebody, yeah. is what actually demonstrates to me that this is my purpose, because I'm like, that's the meter. Because that, because I'm so happy, and that kind of happiness is, doesn't come from buying a beautiful new sari, or just doesn't, doesn't match. And so you know that that's your path, so you know that that's your journey. And so this book was heavy for some, but then I gave it an easy name. So I'm like, well, it's easy to be. And they're like, so what do you write about? I'm like, you? Yeah. No, no, what do you write about? I'm like, you. They're like, I'm like, well, okay, let's start again. What do you write about? I'm like, hmm. For your so it's again with this whole thing, right? We get into this poetry, so it's fun. Then I say, My uh, book called It's Easy to Be You. Right. So I used to make films, and then when I went to Delhi, got married to the love of my life. Um, in those days, we had one, and then we married them. Now we have plenty. Um, and so we then gave up our like, I had this amazing career. Um, and I believe that I was guided to do what I was doing. I don't think. It's all about love. I think when you take on the journey and the promise as a soul, and I know that from a lot of spiritual epiphanies I've had, it was something that I had to do. Um, and so we, I went to Delhi, and then I resigned the Bombay So I was flying up and down, running my shows, and my in-laws are very conservative, right? And so here's the story. Everybody has a story, correct? Even somebody who's empowering has a story. Um, and not that they were lovely people, but they were conservative. And I was taught to have... I don't think in my life, I don't think I believe, I know in my life I've never raised my voice to my parents or my in-laws. So you're raised like that. The means is everything. So um, I wanted to not please them because it was too empowered to please them. So I would wear a sari or a salar kameez. And that time I put the kids to bed or they went to bed, I would go and party. So I wouldn't please them fully. But there was that. And I felt like living in Delhi, um, it wasn't so, it was news based. First of all, filmmaking. So whatever. Dabbled in it for a while, then I had a friend who was representing Omega watches. And she used to work at Western Auto when I used to uh, shoot the Barbita. And she came in and she said, you know, we've got this account, should we open a PR agency? Now, I'd gotten the film just like that anyway. So I was like, let's open a PR agency. So we started representing Omega. Next, we got Favaloba. So we just went from watches to Delhi's all about fashion. So we have the leading labels with us. From Tarun to Dina Dhaka to, you know, who's who, Lina Shema, all of that. Um, and then we did some art festivals. Then we did some kite festivals. And I hated it. Because it was just sophisticated beyond giri. You know, like you're representing things that are not involving anybody. And I was like, oh, I need to go back to psychology. Can't breathe. I hate it. And so 26 years ago, when my baby came in my stomach, I said, let's do Reiki. You know, let's just figure out this science. And it worked. And I could feel the heat. And uh, my guru, or call him a guru, or teacher, or mentor, whatever, when the class was over, he called me and he said, I need you to come on a special day. And I was like, okay. And he said, I'll do the chakras in your feet. And I was like, I'm special. Because, you know, all that. No, but the idea was that I, it wasn't about being special. It was about being saying that you have more responsibility. 
you know, and he knew I understood it. Um, and so I doubled with uh, Reiki and very soon I said, you know what, everybody started saying you've become a cult and you've become mystic, what happened to the good old film days, you've gone to Delhi and become a what nonsense. And, you know, there's a reason to the science. The science is speaking to us and we become really big. So let me study it. So I started studying, um, you know, the computer had just come in, internet. So I sat on the internet and said, look, look, look in hypnosis. And nobody's been a hypnotist in my life. And my parents thought I was insane. You're going to America to study? But I did this and I believed in it. I kept certifying myself. And lo and behold, went back into this right off to year 1998. I started practice. 2000, I got a license. I've been practicing ever since. And it's been beautiful. And then along the way, I realized there's only four people that you can work with in a day or in a group in a workshop. So let's reach people that they can't reach you. Let's give them a means where they don't have to spend money for goddamn sake. Because money has become like our biggest enemy, right? I mean, money represents everything. It's so bizarre because it's just so degenerative, right? Um, and we see proof of that. I mean, people who are powerful are not respected because they don't, you know, offer you back or demonstrate an activity which is empowering in any means. They are. They create roads and they build buildings and they create parks. You have to pay a ticket for it. You know, uh, they build airplanes and then they divide it into classes. There's a business class and there's a culture class. So there's always a divide. We are always creating more and more lack. We always want to be more powerful. Um, and I was like, at least where I stand, I should speak the truth. The truth as it comes to me. And as it, and I should be able to validate something about somebody that is beautiful you know like validate and some you need the validation and as a woman you need the validation because uh, so many of us may be mothers or not and it's to have a child and then to give birth to it and then to nurture it and then to send it away and then to have no expectations is a journey from your womb which is extremely nurturing but it's also extremely uh, expression full or mind full there's so much that goes on with it right um, and so to be able to make people feel that you're okay right you will be okay no matter what you do and there are people then who want to just ask you simple questions like um, you know is it okay for me to is it okay not to be perfectly in control yeah it is because life and circumstances and coincidences brought you here to face the journey that you're facing, you may not see it, you may not be able to observe it. Um, and then somebody is, you know, fearful of dying. And Rumi said something, so I, I won't quote it exactly, but Rumi said, uh, there's a text called, I think, Masnavi. And yeah, it's called Masnavi. And Rumi said in that, I came from the mineral state and I became a plant. <coughs> from the um, vegeta vegetable, whatever that word is, vegetative state, I became a uh, animal. From the animal state, I, be I became a human. Why am I afraid of dying? I've been dying from one state to the other. And that's really what it is. We have built in so much potential within us to just move from one day to the next. Sometimes it's difficult to just wake up in the morning and see purpose in our lives. Um, and we may think that successful... People don't feel that way. They feel more of it because they have to live up to the expectation of themselves, what they've created, and they have to raise the bar. Sportsmen, actors, uh, corporates. The reason they a lot of these people fall into my lap is more challenging. Uh, maybe I've maintained a confidentiality I have. So, say I work with an ex-person, they know come what may, she's not going to talk about it. And there is a there is a, a confidentiality statement, but they know after they work with me. Or in fact, when they come, they'll be like, no, no, we know. I'll be like, please sign the document. Because tomorrow, when something gets leaked out, you know, film starts is very easy. It's not going to come on me because I would not. Right? So I want that document. And it's a, a legal contract. And so you're giving them trust. And you're letting them know that you're not judging them because you're not trying to tell their story. You know, I doesn't give me pride by sitting in the evening and saying, you know what, today I worked with three girls who got raped. No, it wasn't nice that happened. Or three people who are, you know, the guy is so rich, but he's so disempowered. No, poor chap. He's built resources for himself, but he can't access 
his own potential or is in aligning. So, we just told we are not. It's like, mat ro, ye mat karo, wo mat, all of us. I'm sure I've done it as a mother. Ye mat karo, wo mat karo, ye mat karo. The emotions are just sitting. One day they're just sitting in that cauldron and then one day they just erupt. Right? And you don't know what hit you and why you reacted in a certain way, but you reacted and not responded to a situation. And we see that at road rage, we see that at festivals, we see that everywhere. We see that a lot in men because men are or created to uh, project, right? And so when you stop the projection for a tiny second, you say, oh, I have an opinion. Ah! You told to shut up. And that's not just here, it's all over the world. It's not their fault, they're built like that. It's not our fault, we're built to be communicators. And so I would want to work with relationships. One of the most incredible tools that I offer may not be understood, but you may appreciate it is when I understood that women only operate from the three chakras. They operate from the heart. They operate from the communication. They operate from the third eye. Men only operate from, uh, you know, their foundation. They operate from their sexual creative instinct and they operate from their ego to build self-esteem. And they borrow energy. That's why yin and yang is an electric and magnetic response of the body. And so when I wear war paint and I take on driving and I go out and, you know, give a lecture and I go and do stuff, I'm borrowing from my male. Maybe my father, maybe my spouse, maybe my lover, maybe Tom Cruise. You know, I don't care, but I'm borrowing male energy. And when a, when, and when a man falls down, because he only wants to project and he only wants to use his ego, He's not borrowed from his <coughs> intuitive other, right? Uh, because he's inbuilt actually not to borrow it because this poor chap, his ego is not allowing him because he's built like that. But we, on the other hand, have a cave. We welcome experiences, right? A man has to seduce you to take you down to have a sexual experience. You don't feel it that way. So when you understand this, then you don't say, oh, my husband is looking at somebody. Then you say, oh, my God, have you seen that girl? She's really hot. Because he's going to look. So when you stop that response, you shift your relationship because you're like, ah, that is who he is. Hey, I go on. Please be healthy. Look at other women. Right? And a man sees a woman sitting, um, uh, you know, sees his uh, wife sitting or a girlfriend or whoever he's interested in, yapping, yapping, yapping. So, oh, you're flirting. You know, you don't have enough attention from me. No. Let her communicate. It's the tool that she has inherently built in her. She's built to become a communicator. And so when you, when I work with relationships sometimes, I explain this and I just feel like, if you understand this, you should just resolve this. Like there is no need to do anything but look for love. And I, and I truly believe that the one formula for success is that if you can look for love in everything, and you look for the good in everything, and it's a well rehearsed used line, but really break it down. If I could twist something just by seeing it differently, it's like, how do you know the experience of wet? How? Touch it, feel it. Touch it, feel it. Or see it. See it. Feel. Mesus is because you know dry. So you know wet. If there was no dry, you just you'd be like a duck in water. You wouldn't know. So when so in relationships you are gonna be feeble and vulnerable and you have the unlimited power. Most journeys you're meant to observe yourself because you're only representing the divine. In that little body in your you're only representing that. Yesterday I was doing a session with this girl in the morning. And I do online work only with people I worked with because I can feel the energy. And she's uh, she had allergies, etc. Got cured. She's a student in America. And uh, always a panic call from students, and which is fine. Uh, and so I suppose I ran through all the tools and there was this distance. So I was like, and things just come to you. Like I don't, I, I enjoy the work that I do because every <coughs> session is so creative. Um, so I know what I'm doing in terms of making the, helping make the movement. I don't have to use the same formula. And I said, you know what, first let's check if you really, if this is something that you think is a conception that me, the whole, it's not victimization. It's not saying, oh, you know me, I'm going through this thing, which most people do. When something happens, it's not happening to you. It's happening. 
right? Even if your husband's having an affair, it's happening. It's not happening to you. When it happens to you, you fall down. When you can observe it happening and make a correction to by your contribution with more love or more transparency, whatever you may use, then you're able to help that transition happen. But if it becomes your story, now you're the victim. You weren't the victim. The husband deviated. Your relationship really has not, your husband's relation with somebody else has technically nothing to do with your relationship with him. Technically. So if you can watch it and observe it and then alter it without getting making it my situation, then you need to help your husband that you want to be in. Obviously, you want to do this whole thing because you still want to have that relationship. Then you're going to help, be able to help him. But if you're going to attack him, when the poor chap is already vulnerable to this beauty or whatever he's, you know, he's already deviated. Now you want to be deviated. Now you both are deviated. Right? And... Um, yeah, so that's where we are as humans. We're just moving from, so yeah, I was with this client and then I say, okay, let's look. I just want to check if it's not a conceptual reality. So I'm like, if you focus on your inner third eye, uh, are you feeling calm? And she said, no. So I'm like, okay, chaos. I'm like, if you put your hand on your heart, can you feel like you're in the center of a chasing and I'm all over the place? I'm like, okay, uh, your heart, like all other organs, is also an entity. And just because the mouth can speak and you can move it, and just because the ears can be shut so you can cut off sound, and just because you can close your nose and not smell um, something, or doesn't mean that the heart isn't can't be addressed. So let's start speaking to the heart. And we start speaking to the heart, and we start asking the heart. And it's very really periphery work, and just something I had to do in 15 minutes. Um, and we start speaking to the heart, and she starts seeing the heart going stronger. And then the breathing is all erratic, so the breathing comes in, and I was like, you know what? Why don't you give the job of the lungs to the heart? Let's see how powerful. And then she's gone into this. So in that sense, it was suggestibility. It was hypnosis. She got herself to feel that she had actually. And I said, how about we get the blood to start flowing faster? And how do you see it? And then we started slowly working with every organ of the body. And then I was like, okay, the problem was that her friends had bullied her. And she'd been thrown out. And she'd been accused of some relationship. And she could live in that place. And you're in America. It's cold. It's like minus 20 where they are, etc. All this is happening. And how do I, in 20 minutes, she has to go to a class. She's got the window of 20 minutes with me. How do I repair all the relationships? Impossible to do all of this. So I was like, okay, you know what? Why don't you place them in an imaginary round room? Round so there's no connotation. Open to air so she doesn't stop feeling the breath. <coughs> and I'm like, just observe all of them. And obviously all of them are restless. Or they're looking at her. They're gossiping amongst each other. Or I'm asking for them. I'm just saying keep observing. And she's... Now when somebody's with me, can I touch your hand? So if I have helped you breathe, take a deep breath in. Exhale. So I've touched her, right? And so if I'm with the client, I've already made her do this elementary work. When I touch her shoulder, when I, she's going into a thing, I will touch her shoulder. So I know she's not going to break into panic. But that's why with online, it's never the same work. But yeah, because of, she's worked with me with a lot of anchors, I'll switch on some anchors so she doesn't break into further panic. That's how the work is done in layers. And I just get her to observe these people. And as I just keep observing them, and she keeps observing them. And soon the restlessness stops. Soon they are present. And I said, are they as present as I am to you without judging, without having any expectations from this time? Um, and... She goes, no, we do this again in a different way, in a different way. And literally eight minutes down, they're just waiting for her. And I said, now offer them presence. Just be around and see if you believe that they can just sit there and just say, okay, Navya's name, Navya, tell us, what's your story? What, what have we come here for? Now, if she still hasn't forgiven them, she will not... You can't lie to yourself. So that means in five minutes, I'm getting her to forgive everybody, forgive herself for being a part of this thing. Uh, and she called me just before we did this and she said, you know what, I did this three times and a little bit more to finish. And I just went and I said, you have to do nothing. You can't walk out of your room and say, hey guys, because they are obviously cross with you or they're not talking to you. I said, let it settle. Have faith in that. Do the exercise three times and your presence and your intention and your willingness to repair this uh, 
will make the change. She said, today was such a lovely day. Every, nobody spoke to me, but everything was right. Somebody offered me pani and said, you don't have water. So we say, hey, listen, we got some food, food in the fridge. So they weren't really talking, they were indicating. I was like, there you go. So sometimes it's important. It's okay. It's okay. For, you will be okay because you found somebody to talk to. You're okay because you got an auto on a bad day and it's raining and the auto wala says, Ab chai peenge, mujhe peena hai. Dono peete. And you're fine. You know, and so I want to break the myth of having to address your pain through a process. Right? It's for instance, if I asked you to look for something in your life today, this morning, the way you picked up your beautiful necklace or when you picked up your sari or when you decide to wear green, whatever it may, may be for you, Think about that. Think about that time. When you put your mind on something, other thoughts come by. Correct? Now, if you could, if you wanted to close your eyes, you could, but if you wanted to keep them open, be fine. And if you could close your eyes, it'll work. So if you trust what I'm doing, you close your eyes. And just follow the thoughts that are showing up. And no matter what shows up, Allow them to be clouds and birds and move into the endless, infinite sky. You choose your color for the sky. So let them come and give them permission to just go off. You can make them into alphabets, you can make them into camels, you can make them into real birds because it's easy for us to imagine and visualize birds or clouds. And you have your thoughts, just go away. And that's a very simple exercise that it takes a lot of focus and discipline to do this. And as you do this, wait and watch for the next thought to show up. So you're waiting and watching and you're observing the mind. Wait and watch, just like a cat sitting outside the mouse trap, waiting. Wait, watch. You're waiting and watching for the next thought to show up. You're observing your mind. Slowly come back to the here and now come back to my voice. Anybody wants to share the experience with me? Say. So when, when I pick the sari in the morning, I have a very good memory attached to this sari. It was a time when we were not doing very well, and my husband went out and bought the sari for me. He had bought something for me for a very long time. Wow! So I cherished this sari. And in the morning, I was wondering what to pick him. It because. came up. So it's it's very dear to me because it's come at a time that was that was a difficult time. For right. Us. So yes, I went through your process. And, and then when uh, you were waiting and watching, uh, I saw rain. Okay. And I saw two people in the rain. I don't know where that came from. And then my voice came back. What about you? Um, when I went out to the sky, like you said, and um, I saw my, you talked about cat, so I saw my cat watching. Watching you? Yeah, watching me. And when we went to waiting and watching, your cat? That's it, that's cat. And then your mind? That's my alarm. And then, and then what happened to your mind, your thoughts? Okay, what about you? My space expanded on that pause. So there were many thoughts which were, I was making different things and thinking that fly in the big sky. And then there came a time when it was almost all done and waiting for another thought to come. That's when the time expanded and I think everything started getting bigger. Okay, how about you? Gazing the sky, enjoying it, being in the present. And then when I said you're waiting and watching and observing your mind? Thank you. What about you? Uh, me neither. It was a similar experience in the sense that I I started watching my breathing. <laughs> Fantastic. What about you? <laughs> Very bad. <embarrassing. laughs> I was stating all this. Nothing. I was just thinking I have to go home and be with my mother in law whether she's okay or not, to be quite honest. Okay, lovely. What about you? <laughs> For me, it started with my, I saw my house with my half painted canvases and then after that it just went blank into a huge space. Okay. Thank you. So for her who went blank, for you who went blank and for you who went blank, if you went wanted to learn meditation, you would take a camp for five days, travel to the Himalayas, travel to Rishikesh, travel to Ganpati Phule, and then say, Okay, I have to 
teach myself, okay, what is meditation? Okay, my mind affluence my thoughts. That was meditation. It took what? Three minutes? That was three minute exercise where you went blank and that's your moment of divine truth. Because if I said, Big your mind to a time when you have no thoughts, you'd be like, okay, what is no thoughts? Okay, no thoughts is also a concept, mm -hmm. right? Everything is a conceptual reality, right? And you were also breaking down information and taking yourself, perhaps, and I, this is really fast because it's not part of a workshop. Because, like, if somebody tells you now, you think what you know, you keep thinking, I mean, because so when you right, say, wrong, correct. You know, you don't, don't, you're thinking more of that than what, what you should be thinking. You know? mm. Yes, yeah, so when you're Not waiting, so think about it. When I say you're waiting and watching, watching, if you really stay disciplined and you go watching, waiting, watching becomes actually the trigger for you to have no thought. Because if you tell your subconscious mind mm. something over again, it becomes its truth. Mm. And it becomes its truth and you're breathing calmly, it becomes an anchor. When it comes an anchor, it triggers a state where, so when I'm speaking with you right now, um, I'm at beta consciousness. So if I put an ECG on my brain and I measure my brain frequency, the stimulation, it will be about 32 hertz a second. While you're listening, you're at alpha, which is another 4 to 8 hertz. Theta, which is theta healing, is another, take on another 4 8, right? What's happening is that you're, as I'm speaking to you, you were bringing your brain stimulation down so you could hear me. If he was standing outside and goes, bee, bee, bah, 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 none of us could do this because the brain stimulation is so much we can't hear. And so that is the birth of deviation actually. The birth of deviation comes from a time and place where you make an association your mind doesn't know. Right? Like I was saying, you're hypnotized all the time. You hypnotize to fear something. You watch somebody being raped. You hear a story. You hear, read the newspaper. And you say, oh, get to the lito safe. Nahi hai. Right? You know. We hear too much happening there. Mela safe nahi hai. You know, everything becomes a compounded by a conditioning, right? Because at some space in time, and, and, and couch potato more watching TV, where you tell your brain, ah, it's a holiday, I'm just like watching. That's the time everything is going in, like the mother's baby in the stomach, right? Who is just listening to everything. Everything. Because when I got to regress myself, I regress myself in a very powerful camp, um, I went back to my mother's stomach and I said, Mama, you didn't tell me I was born 10 and a half months. And she said, how would you know that? And I said, this is what you said to the doctor? And she said, what the hell? Who told you? And I said, I went into and I found what you said and what happened. Um, and you just, you, you know you. You can actually do that. I mean, it, it doesn't have to be part of your journey. For me, it was an important part of me recognizing my tools. So it's something that I yeah. could... Work with, but when I do regression therapy, so I do regression back to say more scientific stuff because I work with the mind with more athletes and more corporates. And so you take yourself back to, for instance, there's a gentleman uh, who uh, came. To, so I just want to finish the before I go to the gentleman. So, and, and if you go back to delta, which is sleep zero to four, is when your brain is except the one and a half hour spindles in your so you sleep. So one and a half are really tight, one and a half and then comes out. So it's, uh, which I talk about in this book. Uh, in your sleep, you are experiencing dreams. And those dreams are uh, stories or narratives that are potentially available in your soul journey. Or the ones you haven't realized or the ones that you're still going on in your head. Because your brain is going through those spindles. Right? If you were totally at zero to four, then there would be no rapid eye movement. Then you'd be just literally out. But even though there is no human stimulation from the external, the inner world opens up. That's why they say, go to bed at a certain time. Because because of the sun and the moon, you are going to get the right resonation with the planet trying to communicate to you. So there is none of us sleep in time and none of us wake up in time. That's really what it is. And so this gentleman comes to me like the first year of my practice is a really funny story. And I would worked with his daughter. His daughter had a nasty divorce and she was really abused, etc. And uh, she said, you have to work with my dad. Now, dad is one of the most powerful men in the country. I don't know. I just, and luckily always there is sari to work, especially with men, you want to look professional. Um, and I remember in Delhi, uh, now I have a really beautiful office. At that point, I had one of these uh, government buildings, they're called DDA flats, right? So I had that as an office in the beginning. And 
this gentleman gets off his Bentley and he has a car and I'm running my sorry I'm late and I cross from the other side I said let me go up before he comes at me he has a I was like whoa that's a man and then I kind of recognize him I can't share the name with you because of confidentiality I'm like okay that's her father okay this is my first few months of practice and luckily I've had my you know media confidence from my career so it's not like I'm, I'm feeling that way and I'm like so, so how can I help you and he goes I'm not confident in my head I said Aap confident hai, to mera kya hoga? <laughs> you are not confident but he actually he actually felt he wasn't confident right so I walk back and that was pure oh see I hadn't collected all these tools and experiences so pure tool work right so we went back as a classic regression we go back to a place in time we're going back in time and so what people do is, is like, oh, I'm here, I'm there, you know, they're not there, you've got to keep bringing them back. And then he goes back to a time, I'm like, how old are you in this moment? And he goes, I don't know. I said, I know you don't know what, how, how many fingers would it make for you to indicate how old you are? And he was 62 then. So he goes, so he could be seven, I don't care. My idea is to make him okay, to make him more confident, to make a man like that more confident. Uh, or to at least give him the impetus or the trigger or the tool or whatever to enhance it. And um, interestingly, never forget the session, he uh, goes back to a time when he's cycling in Sultanpur with his father's friends, a very impressionable age, your father's taken you out to the day cycling with his buddy. So wow, I've grown up, right? And he falls down, his father was from Oxford. So I'm talking about a big lineage, big industry. And uh, he's like, so this is coming up in regression. And he's like, uh, his dad nudged him and he fell down and he looked around and he felt stupid and shameful that his dad's friend and he's fallen down and his dad said let me give you a hand son or you'll never get started that is his underconfidence and he lived and he's and so obviously because we went through that incident it came by that he was like and his dad walked off and everybody's laughing they weren't laughing at him they were just laughing but a seven year old such an impressionable age felt so you know ripped off his sort of like growing manhood or whatever you may say. Now he, he had the lineage of the money and the family and the history and the industry which he took on really well and he went to Harvard and he was actually the guy on Forbes at the time uh, who had a caricature with a, a, a table of people and it said uh, and the myth was that he uh, that's his style like he takes his board of directors with him. There was no style. He couldn't get things started, so he had to take Pinchar Log with him to get a meeting started. And people think that is his. So he made it that, right? That he will come, 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 literally, if you, if you put it that way. And, um, and he found his confidence back. Now, is that a miracle? No. Am I a guru? No. Just guided him to find his strength. Was that the only incident? I will never know. Was that the incident and not something else? I don't know. And that's when I broke the myth of past life work because I said, how do I know we're all one spirit? How do I know that a story I take you back to is not my story? Because I truly believe we are one. I truly, completely, 100% believe we are one spirit, right? So how am I, the person comes in and says, was that my father who hit me in my last life? I don't know, you tell me, does it feel like that? And I was like, you know what, I've got to go beyond this, this regression is not... Is, is, is kind to some, find solutions, but it's unkind to some. So I, when people come and say, man, I want to do a past life session, and I'll be like, let's go from where you are to where you need to be. Because I want you to feel better. I want to know that you're doing better. And I'm not saying it's a one-time miracle. Yeah, it's work, but work will guide you to another place. And then that's why in COVID, this book was about recognizing individual consciousness. It was about... And so these books were written together, like I wrote these two in like 48 days and then the publisher took another, I literally wrote all day in COVID, like I would sit in the morning and write till evening and I, then of course we worked on different aspects and then chapters etc and then we were out, the book was out in COVID uh, and, um, and, and the idea was that how, who's the guru now, we don't know what the hell is happening, people are stuck in their homes, they have no money, there's claustrophobic of each other of spaces of their families like it was just a hell hole right people are dying people are losing I know people who passed away in COVID and the cremation grounds for kilometers were full my really really close friends was what the parents they burned them somewhere outside the road it was bad it was really bad 
And I was like, what is, who's, who's the guru? Who's the guru? I'm looking, who's the guru? Yeah, I can't tell people the gurus in you. They're like, if Bhagwan is in our why not see him? So I'm like, okay, nature is the guru. And so this book was about nature. And I said, nature has no issue living. It has no issue dying. It's not going to scream out and say, you burnt me, it's gone. Right? And, I, and so I talk about that in this. I, I tell them the time is your biggest gift. And symmetry is your biggest algorithm. Because if you remain uh, true to yourself, if you can speak the truth in your resonating... Uh, like if you, if you say smile, if you see a, 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 something written which says smile, you're forced to smile. You look like an idiot. But after a while, you're like, why am I smiling? Because you're seeing that. That's how we resonate, right? And that's really how the subconscious works because it's 90%. It's got everything. It's got your imagination. If I ask you to lift this, I don't know, it's heavier. <laughs> lift, uh, you know, maybe the car outside. You may say, I can't do it. But if you say, can you imagine? You're like, yeah, I can imagine. So imagination actually creates the myth inside you that you're not good enough. And it's in your subconscious. Imagination creates as the power to, and why is that true? Because you are part of the infinite. So your imagination links up with that huge cloud of consciousness. And you can imagine the worst. You can imagine the better people who do well are successful. People who don't fail. Right? And the ones who fail are the ones who make themselves believe that I'm not good enough. Right? And as a child, you're told, Baap ki tera ho jayega, aise mat kar. O bichare baap ki tera ho jayega. Or uska baap bichare chale gaya, to baap ko hi dhun raha You know, I did this experiment in college, uh, in our college, <coughs> when we were doing some work. Uh, we were, I, I, I did some work with Milana Azad Medical uh, College too. We started the AIDS campaign in Delhi, basically. And um, so finally, I've done a lot of first things. Rajavadan Dattar was the first Olympian. Abhinavadan Dattar was the first to get a good whatever. It's always been a start. I was the first show on TV. Um, Alec Adamsi and I worked on a, uh, the first uh, CD run from India on Kama Sutra. It was the first ever title from India for Apple. That was my baby again. There are a lot of these first things I don't know what the universe wants me to do now. But I do, I do understand that there's a lot of that. And um, what was I telling you about? I'm going into my story. Yeah, so we were doing a, a research and went to the Sabji market behind my house and asked the children about their families and their fathers. And when you have the most moment, you have the most fun moment. You know, empower them. You're playing, you're free. So one day we said this, that, the other, that, I made a coke, I bought a shirt, I did this, I went to the photo, I went to the museum. One kid says, when my father came, I hit him with a hammer. Okay, how is that empowering? He's found out, and I was like, really crazy, I'm like, who's this kid, I need to talk to him. Found out, his dad was a koile wala. Koile wala, he would come back, koila. Koila, koila, koila. Go in the morning, come back. This is a sabji market, all the other father, sabji superstar. You know, when you're a sabji market, you're the king. You're like, Meri bindi, tumhari bindi se better hai. Meri aid better hai. Meya bhoat saal se bhena ho. Hamara. You know, there's that pride, of course. Now, there's this koala wala son between all this, who goes in the morning, comes back at night, drunk. Right? And the kid is waiting, Meri papa kab aayenge. Right? And the father comes and slaps him. That's love. That's love. That's his moment of joy. Now, can, now when you hear this, you know why people are so convoluted in their head. Because it's the mind is like that. It's not that we are at fault. A mind is created such a way that the subconscious mind is actually working against us too. It is helping us because it's got all the data. It's got everything from the day you were conceived. Right? So too many people there. Right? Too many people. Um, so it's got all that data. It's got your beliefs where you think I'm not good enough or I'm very good. Or, I'm so cool. No, you're looking like an idiot. With all that makeup and all that jewelry and all that, you're looking like an idiot. But if you think you're cool, wow, great, you're cool, right? How, how can you beat somebody's perception? You can't. And that's why it's so difficult to make a change because your, your, your imagination is in your subconscious, but your rational mind and your real power is in your, the 10% of your conscious mind. So you can keep trying, ma, first of March, you watch me, I'm going to start running. 
it was too uh, hot. First of April, now it never comes, right? Because you're using your willpower, right? Willpower, when willpower, there's no adage, when willpower and imagination meet, imagination will win, right? And then it's also got your rational mind, right? Your, the reason we can't change and the reason we hold on to sometimes um, mistruth or misrepresented fact or a debilitating moment or have pride in something stupid we did and like Badi Shekhi Mara, it's not, it's not fun, you know, it's not fun that you did this thing, but he's like really, really happy, like why is he happy? Because he's, that gives him pride. And you're like Pagal, eh? but he's not Pagal, his mind is Pagal because we created to be this crazy people who hold on to all this data. And if you ask somebody today, anybody smokes here? She asks, smokes? Anybody? Good. We're all non-smokers. You ask somebody, uh, like to smoke? They go, yeah. What does it do for you? Ah, increases my focus. Really? Yeah, makes me feel very focused. So do you know that smoking takes away 30% of your res conscious responses? Yeah, okay. It increases your hand tremors by 300%. It increases your heart rate by 17%. It takes away one hand. Really it gets you to focus? No. But the human mind is, uh, the, the conscious mind is rational. It's the mind that won't let us go onto the street without clothes on. So it's the mind that protects us from things that, I think the traffic is okay. My mom's saying don't go this traffic. But I go there and I'm like, oh no, 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 no. Protective mind says, no, no, wait. Mom said that. So the protective part of your mind is also attached to your rational mind. It will help you to do the right things, right? But because everything is buried in your subconscious, it's very difficult to negotiate with it. And that's why it needs technique. And that's why technique should come at a small cost. Not have to go to the therapist because if you go and the therapist cures you of anxiety, now he's become your therapist. So now the children are wearing a label that says, I have a therapist, you have a therapist, I have a therapist. That's a, new, that's a new trend. And psychologists are okay with it. No, I'm not okay with it. So if a kid comes in, I tell the parents to say, and they, I don't want it. I say, no, the parents are sitting far away. Then I put the kid, da, kid there and I say, you know what? I'm not going to be your crutch. You can't come back to me. Let's figure this out right now. So I literally threaten him to do this now. Because, and of course they do well with me and most kids will tell their parents, I want to go and they'll be like, I don't know what you do. Oh, I don't know what you do after all this. My kid is feeling better. It's always this reaction that we don't have anything to do. You have to take care of it. 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 But that ego defeats them. Right? So now the work that I do with children becomes a also have to handle the parents. So I finish an hour session with the child. Then I get on the phone and I say get your husband in or whatever. Then I spoke with them. So there's A, I charge almost nothing for children and then I I should be charging five times because now the grandmother wants to know or the coach wants to know or whatever. So I have to sanitize the whole atmosphere because kya na man ne kya kya hypnosis kya 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 unno banaya ye kya wo kya or an educated person will say she went into your past life tell me na what did she do you know like it, I mean this is not an inquiry this is a, you've got your child let's look after him don't have to get into it don't ask questions I will tell you if he is doing something and that's part of my agreement if he is doing something that is I know, and I know kids who, you know, who want to finger somebody they shouldn't, and they will see, share it with me, or they do more drugs, or they do more alcohol. Now, I won't say stop doing drugs, because I know it's an addiction. I will work on it, and I will say, well, if I find out, or if, you know, I mean, I work around it, so I can tell the parents that this is what it is, so you need to be careful. I won't say he's doing so much weed, or he's access to cocaine, but I will make sure that I'll start correcting them and saying, you know, you should watch where your kid goes after this because I think you need to keep... You know, so I'll give another kind of advice. I'm not breaking the confidentiality, but I'll work through it. It's complicated at times. You work with the principals and school teachers and those are the people who can work with more than the parents because the parents find out all hell breaks loose. First thing is, the whole drama starts, right? Victimization. It becomes about me. You are you, but it's not me. And that's why it wasn't. It's easy to be me. Because everything is me. It's not about you. It's about the journey we take together. So yeah, so the books are the means to kind of do this. And um, I think... You're talking about the subconscious being 90%. You're talking about working with people with problems. 
have you seen the other side when it empowers you? When of course. When it empowering, like the topic I was telling you, we are talking about how it empowers the creative process. So when you empower the creative process, you are an athlete. That's the finest example of somebody who has to get better, uh, feel motivated, <coughs> feel empowered, take you have to find a plethora of different tools and ways and means to look at a situation. So the, there's creativity within uh, an athlete's blood, mind, body, rhythm. If you make an apple look like an orchard in the head, um, you have to make a target look like their dream for India. Yeah, it's, it's completely empowering. And I think, I believe that I've been given both because I can borrow one from the other, right? Um, and it's empowering to work with empowered people um, because you can show them the mirror. You know, you can show them how amazing it is that the creator within them decided to, to be represented through that beauty. So that I empower everybody. I empower everybody's creativity because there is that potential in everybody. There is that uh, rhythm and joy and uh, uh, curiosity. So... The subconscious has everything. We are actually very correctly only leaning on the bad. We're so used to dwelling and dwelling. Wake up and smell the coffee. Get out and walk. Go exercise. Uh, and then again, I think schooling is, is not correct. Because schooling helps you get into a routine which is lethargic, which is monotonous, which is not, we as are not taught, we're not taught the essence of our being. Where most kids will say, please, oh, I don't want to go for meditation. Why? Feel the joy of it. So, just to answer your question, yeah, the subconscious has every means to source the beauty because it's got everything sitting there. So, people come to my office and they want I put a lot of art as well, uh, interesting, empowering uh, stuff. Um, and I will say to them, I'm like, you know, if I meet them outside, I'll be like, do you remember the painting? Just, and they'll be like, no. I'll be like, close your eyes. What do you see on your left? Oh my God, I can see that. I never saw the green painting. Like, so there you go. So somebody's having a creative moment, a creative whatever. And you're like, how did it? Oh, maybe point it out. I was like, no, oh, everything is here for you. It's in your periphery. Your subconscious notes everything. And that's why change is so tough. And that's why you feel. So your subconscious is empowering you because it's giving you everything. But it's also disempowering because it's got everything. So things you don't want to see, things you don't want to absorb. Other people, so they say in spirituality, they say that the energy is less, don't spend much time with it. Because like my family is always worried that, you know, like you're always working, but they can't complain because I'm always in through about a plan. So they, they know that I'm not letting it absorb me. But, but that's really what it is. So you, of course, there are means and ways and that's the work that we do with athletes, right? Go back to a previous shot, go into that shot, see what the shoulder feels like. What did you do? Oh, that was you lifted it from the wind. You really lifted that shot from the wind? That must be a miracle. We go back and that's really the shot that made them, you know, win the, win the uh, shootout or win the championship or whatever. So you take that shot, you retrieve it. And then you go into the technique and you realize, oh my God, we hadn't put the choke in the gun. And the last shots were done with a choke. And you put a choke in the gun and the bullet is out and you don't catch it in the first. Uh, the clear is out and you don't catch it, say, in a shotgun. And you've got another... Uh, 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 ammo that can come out the choke allows the shot to not be distributed too much because the choke sits so there's more chance of catching the clay <coughs> for instance it's like oh my god we haven't been using a choke so let's start so when you use a choke the gun is heavier so then we change the movement of the shoulder you can't do all this in between two competitions but you can do all this training it's not going to change on its own we'll have to go into his body calm his mind accept that muscle marry it with a goal marry it with the Olympics marry it I'll sing or I'll play the Paris rhythm or I'll show him uh, I just went to Paris and looked at the fields etc we went for a, a game um, like a review session I'll put those posters on a projector then he'll breathe in so we build slowly a new association then I'll say okay when you go to this range take that breath it has to be short it has to be takes that breath five times he's like you know what Today I shot so well, my shoulder moved and I could catch that target without a joke. You know, so it's technical work, but it's because he's empowered through the things that he's done well. And sometimes he's not turning around like, okay, let's turn it around. Let's observe this. When you start observing something, it lessens its impact on you. Because emotions are energy in motion. 
right? And so they're there, you know, sometimes somebody does this to you. And you're like, ouch! See, kya hai yaar? Mazak mein maara hai. And you're like, haan, but why am I so irritated? Because that memory of something is buried in different parts of your body. And so, I had a girl once, beautiful girl from Chandigarh. My God, she was stunning. It's an interesting story. She comes to me, um, I'll say it really quick, but it's a very interesting story to understand the work uh, that I do. And I had met her friend who's a hypnotist on our 10th wedding anniversary in <coughs> Nepal with our girls. And my husband met this absolute stunner and I said, Chalo, I will read books. You know, he'll be distracted enough. So very, she was chatting with her for a long time. My girls were playing. I said, oh, today is a good day. I can read a book. Because this lovely chick is in the pool. And I was very distracted. Two hours later, he brought me himself there. I said, and we are. It's like, she's Sharon and she's a hypnotist. I said, oh. Mm -hmm. So he said, Chala, now that I lost these two. So that's what happened. And he was, she was in London. And she said, you know, I have a girlfriend. So I don't know this girl at all. Who's moving. I can't remember where. She's definitely moving to Australia. I can't remember from where. I think Amsterdam. A flight via Dubai. And she's seeing you for a few hours. She's got a really bad issue. So I'm like, yeah, you know, don't send me these people for three hours. If it's really bad because I'll need, I'll never take on a session if I'm not in town. So say I have to work with you. If I'm not going to be in town next week, I won't take, take you on unless we can work on the phone. Because if I'm not there, making it worse. Because sometimes in the middle of things, more stuff comes out. Mm -hmm. I'm working on a bad head, on a headache. More of that memory comes up, right? And we've done two and a half hours. We've done all that. I've given you some protective anchors. I know when you can take a breath, you'll get calm. But there is that thing. Anyway, that is a really small. We, we have a house on the second floor at that point. We had an apartment. It was an apartment on the ground floor in the next building, right next to. And I used to use that for work. And uh, she came in. And because she was a friend's friend, less professionally, I met her down. I said, come, come, have a shower, whatever, all of that. There's a guest room. And uh, what do you want to work on? And she said, I have really bad neck ache. Like it's not gone for years. Like the neck just pains so much. Uh, and so this is a good example because you know how pain goes away in the work that I do. And I was like, okay, so we'll get behind it. She said, no, we're going to do a past life session. I said, no, we're not because there's no way I'm taking you into a past life and leaving you and you're taking a flight. No, I don't do that. She said, well, we are going to do a past life session. And I said, and how do you know that? She said, because there's a Guru Nanaka photo in your room on the left. And I was like, yeah. And the clock is stuck at four o'clock on the bedside. And I was like, okay. And then she said that the wall has two light bulbs on opposite sides. That two, like, oh, what is this? Shade over there. And on the opposite side of the bed, one bulb is put on the light, one is missing. So I said, Give me a second. So I go in. So you the light, one bulb is missing. Look at the clock, it's stuck at four. And I know the Guru's energy. So I was like, Okay, we're doing a pasta session. Whatever. She saw this. We're doing this. I don't know who she is. I'm very intrigued. I drop both the girls to school. I come back, get sent to breakfast, start a session. It's a 15 minute session. 50 minutes, okay, and this is a good 15, 18 years ago. And she is, so there's a couch, obviously neck is paining, and so I have a chair, and I have a couch, a long couch, like a, a neck is paining, and she's tired from her travels. And I said, she's very full of etiquette now, so she has a, she could have laid down, she didn't lay down. And I was like, have you rested, have you been lying down? She said, no, 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 no. I was like, okay, why don't you lie down? We can do the session. And she opens her hair, it's like a movie, and her hair comes down like Rapunzel, and just beautiful Chandigarh, so beautiful skin, gorgeous hair and I'm like, what a beauty, yaar. like wow, and she's lying down and I was like, okay, what, what, what can I help you with and I'm thinking past life, karna hai, 15 minutes hai, flight hai, and I was dropping out of the airport and the airport's very close to where I live, 20 minutes drive. so I was like, okay, so and she's like, you know, let's just my, I said, well, you're very disturbed, she said, yeah, I have a really bad neck ache, I said, what have you done about it, because it's not you know, the past life, she says, no you know, I, uh, just forget it I just said, so when I see physical pain, it's the best place to work with because something is talking to you. There's something, whether it's an, you know, it's an organ, or it's a suppressed emotion, or it's a narrative, or it's a conceptual reality. I don't care, but it's speaking to you, right? It's right there present and it wants attention. Like all of us need attention. When you get attention, everything is sorted. You know, you cry about something, cry about something, and somebody says, kya chahiye? You don't even have that pani, but because somebody says, Kya chai pani la dung, you forgot me that pani, and then five minutes later they come and say, How much are you crying? Yeah, I'm not rotten, and I got distracted. But actually, it's it's sometimes it's just that attention, right? So she, as I go, so tell me what you all, you know, I said, How long have you had it? She's like, You know, about when back in college, and I was like, You had it since college, and you know, like, what's going on? It seemed to have 
in some years. She said, yeah, then the MRI is done. This is just nice and go away. And I was like, damn, I need to get this. In my head, I was like, get it, get it, get it. Like for me, this is the challenge, right? So I'm like, okay, um, why don't you just like tell me about college? And she was from Chandigarh, so not confident. Girls really will be out there. She came to Bombay, lived in Bandra, like, uh, not Bandra, um, where Shah Rukh Khan lives with that area. Reclamation Bandstand. there, Bandstand, Bandstand. Uh, in a hostel, uh, uh, in a, you know, like a PG, like in Bombay. And her roommate was a Bombay, whatever, girl, so she had a lot of confidence. And this girl was stunning. So the guys used to hit on her. She started hating the roommate. But she couldn't deal with it. And the roommate was like, the guys were just hitting on her because she was absolutely stunning. Started to hate her. Couldn't talk, couldn't tell her parents. Because when she was like, what do you mean? You know? So she birthed an incommunication in her neck. We worked on it, released it, did forgiveness, it was gone. It's never come back. She writes to me from Australia saying, what the hell? Like, so some people write, some people just meet 20 years later and they give you a big hug and you're like, and who are you? Because I forget. And they're like, you worked on my daughter, my God, she lost her allergy and then she went to school and she got married she had a child and I'm like, Bata de te, yaar. So it's like a doctor, right? You go to a doctor and you don't get okay. You go back and say, doctor, yaar, nah, my allergy is not going, but if you get okay, no, call the doctor and say, thanks doc. You think you're flirting with him. That's the same situation with me, right? And she goes back to um, her issue and she said, you know, when I come to Jaipur with my husband, oh, so the issue was, why it was so grave, was that she was married. And she said, every time I make love to my husband, my boyfriend, my ex-boyfriend, is like a monkey on my back. He's like, a, I, I, I have, we, we get into the act and I can only think of him. And she said, I don't want to do this. I, he's a really nice guy. And I don't want to be with my ex-boyfriend. That's why I left him. And she said, I not and I can't go to a normal doctor. I think I'm a And, you know, so obviously my girlfriend Sharon introduced him. She knew the space. And I said, so when they go in, she's like, you know, when I come to Jaipur, uh, uh, so she didn't tell me where. Okay, so it's fine. We go back into her time, she goes into a past life. Now I'm actually giving you a story of something that I don't work on, but we slip into her life and I'm like, where, where do you find yourself? And she's actually at the funeral pyre of a military officer. Uh, well, I mean, he's dying, not funeral pyre, sorry. Uh, first shot, first shot in my head, again a movie. First scene we go to is that she's on the, he's dying and she's, he's begging for forgiveness and he's like, Forgive me because I was hurt you so much in the life. Cut to, she's in a, um, look, that's my subconscious. Right? I'm a movie, my first memory is, so I, I will describe the scene as a movie person. That's how the subconscious works, right? That is empowering. Um, and so cut to, she's at a, a funeral pyre and the man goes away. And then she goes back to times and places with this person. He's from the same, he's, he's in the military, his name is the same. He's in the army, is the same. And this incident happens in Bikaner in her past life. Whatever, Bikaner, Jaisalmer, one of them. And they have a home in that city. I can't remember which one, but one of the cities. So every time she comes there, the presence of the boyfriend is a lot. Now, great sorted, did a lot of forgiveness. Oh, this is done 50 minutes. Made triangles, prisons, whatever I knew at that point. Da, da, da. They uh, look for, she wants a baby boy. She got a baby boy. She had a baby boy. Baby boy, obviously, must have grown up to be 15 now. Whatever, history sorted, session over. Can I validate this story? I can't. But I can say that if you feel better, perhaps it was part of your journey. Could it be a narrative from a movie? Yeah. Could it be an imagination? Yeah. So neck pain went away. never came back. Went back to her husband. The dreams got over. For a lot of technical work, I will teach them the right tools to breathe and the right tools to dismiss the narrative. You know, that is obviously the technique, but all of this can be done. So, nothing is irreparable. Nothing is beyond yourself. Everything is in you. You know, every potential. And I'm saying this because I work with everything. It's not, and I don't like to speak about my work. So, work's not coming because I'm putting a label there saying, look what I do. In fact, I don't do readings for my books. I just say people will find them. You know? Um, and, of course, recently the publisher is saying, you're everywhere, but you don't do books on the book. I'll take my books. So, okay, Harshil, I said, again, I've forgotten. So, this morning, panic call, I was like, Harshil, so, Bloomsbury, then, karega, please, so, you organize a pile, but actually, I wanted three books to show, because I never seem to, so, I will take a book picture and send it to my publisher, since he had tried, I held the book. They keep going to events, and forget the books. We just did this event in Davy, 3,500 people, mm. and I had only one book. So, 3,500 people, I could have advertised this, no. 
add one book. You know, like, so it doesn't click in, you know, because you're not, you're not meant, and that's why it's about you. And they kept saying, talk about your story, come on. And I was like, no, oh, yeah, it's, it's a, I'm not the guru. They have to find themselves. And if they can't find them, then I can't, you know, help them. But they, it has to be about your power because it's present. Can I ask you, you know, yes. three points how yeah. we can find ourselves? Till we get three um, Okay, so the one uh, way is to have a nurture, somehow find anything that stimulates you. Anything, <clears throat> right? A person, an inspiration, a coat, a tree, a stone, water, alcohol, I don't know, whatever. Okay? Um, anything that stimulates you and make it your anchor so you can have the intention to do something well. Because without intention, you go nowhere, right? The second is tell your story. Because when you tell your story, you're releasing the, the imprint it has on your body and your soul, life. And third, find a dream. Because the dream is attached to your soul purpose. Because we all are here for a soul purpose. And if that dream, if you have the intention, then the dream will stay. If you have an anchor, then you'll keep it alive. So it'll be Brahma, Vishnu, Shiva. It'll be, I'm present to this reality, accept it. I engage with it. Morally, not morally, right, wrong, good, bad, upa, niche. And I will give away this pain because I will rejoice in the fact that my breath keeps me alive. And greatest joy is the creator in me, found me to enjoy this space because every other planet on earth, uh, every other entity or species is not experiencing this joy of just, you know, yes. having, having a, an expression to be, even sometimes like I say, pain is beautiful because then like, I'm heartbroken, I'm like, you're so lucky to have this kind of pain that you're actually crying. Your heart is bleeding. It is so fortunate because people don't have this kind of joy. Thousands of people in a relationship don't feel that pain. They're so angry all the time, right? Or protecting their own body mechanism always. So lucky, you're so fortunate. So I make pain so beautiful that they're like, you are feeling it? This wasn't so bad. I got a new label on. <laughs> so sometimes it's clear it losses, right? And sometimes it's just a really good process. So yeah, I hope that helped a little bit. Yeah. Yeah. I hope I was able to do justice to your... I grew up in Bombay. Where do you stay? So I grew up, I went to Villa Chiza, uh, Safari College. I grew up in Beach Candy. Yeah. And then my husband lived on Altamont Road. So we still have a home, but we use it sparingly because we live in Delhi. You come from town? I come from town, yeah. Mm -hmm. Which is, I know people in Bombay say this, but I go up and down. I'm so excited with Bombay. I go to Bangalore for lunch, but I'm like, don't you? I'm like, doesn't matter, we'll come back. It's only a road. You could be going further down. So I'm very excited. I can go Bandra, Jogo, Palaba, or so on. Take me anywhere. It's, it's, you don't know when the day is over, right? You don't know when your life is over. Right? Enjoy it. Right. Yeah. Do what the creator does best. I found a very undelivery life. <laughs> 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 you have to have been from Bombay. Yeah. Yeah. So, so dad used to do it. I don't know. 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 For oh, such a long I time, my mother is very sick. I just lost her mother. Right. Right. My mother in law is also doesn't give us. So, so important. Yeah. Both of them are in Nikki. Can you take a picture of everybody? So yeah, yeah. Yes, yes. Sure. For sure. Yes. Thank you for your Thank you so Thank much. You so much. Amazing patience and <laughs> eagerness to engage with this.